there are just a few points I would like to give as a starter when we're looking at uh, foreign policy, especially when we're looking at foreign policy with respect to the United States. The United States is the only superpower today, and it is, without any doubts, the most important country in the world. If India wants to impose sanctions on anybody, we can't do it. If Britain wants to impose sanctions on anybody, they can't do it. If China wants to impose sanctions on anybody, they can't do it. But if America wants to impose sanctions on anybody, they can do it, and they do do it, because basically, for, the reason for that is you have to understand financial controls. Where financial dealings are done with the US dollar, and the control of that US dollar is with the United States, they control everything. Uh, that is in a very, very broad perspective. Now, with the uh, India-US uh, partnership, there are just four, it, it just look into four basic pillars. I think the first thing is the human relationship. You see the people-to-people -people dimensions, leadership to leadership dimensions, right? The diaspora of the, of the country, right? That is one dimension which I think you've got to really look at. The second, uh, second uh, dimension is the political imperatives of whichever country there is, right? So here when we are dealing with the United States, the US has got certain political imperatives. So what are those political imperatives? India has got certain political imperatives. What are those political imperatives? Third is the economic side of it. You see, uh, now, of course, we're getting into very strong uh, defense cooper cooperative, uh, cooperation with the United States. But then the economic side of any relationship is very important. And then the last one, which I think is the most important of all, which I would urge each one of you to see uh, and uh, sort of read about it at your own terms, is the strategic convergences and divergences which really make the relationship, right? And uh, here I would like to tell you that while people-to-people -people relationships may be good or bad or indifferent, ultimately it is your strategic convergences which make the relationship. If you take away the strategic convergences, nothing else will matter, right? So be very, very certain of that. Uh, you may have very good people-to-people -people relationships. They only carry you that far. And I will give you an example. If you look at Indo-US relationship right from 1947 till today, it has, if you, uh, all, all the people who do mathematics and algebra and all that, business, you know, you've got the sine curve. India's relationship with the United States has been something like that. It goes up, it goes down, it goes down miserably. Right, um, I was talking a little bit earlier as to uh, our relationship at the summit level, uh, President John F. Kennedy and Prime Minister Nehru. I mean, what a great friendship it was, but it didn't really translate into anything on the ground. The people-to-people -people relationship has always been very friendly. Basically, we are democracies and um, we, we, we see each other in a very, very positive light. So what we are witnessing today is a very strong people-to-people -people relationship, a very strong diaspora connect, a very strong summit level, uh, summit level connect between the leaders of the two countries. And I think the most important is very, very strong strategic convergences. I will speak about my aspect of it, what I feel about it towards the end. But uh, I will first make a start with uh, Mr. Uh, Dipanjan Roy Chaudhary. Uh, he is a senior assistant editor of Foreign Affairs for the Economic Times. And anybody who reads the Economic Times will know what it means. You know, it's very difficult to get in there. When we are talking about Indo-US relations challenges and way forward, I guess in everybody's mind will be the recent visit of President Trump to India and uh, yeah and people who definitely compare his visit with the last three visits, which is President Bush, which really transformed this relationship, and followed by President Obama's 2010 visit and 2015 visit. Um, I don't need to tell this audience that President Trump is different. He's different from everybody. Uh, whether you say he's transactional, whether you say that he, is, uh, he speaks his mind, whether you say he doesn't have the you know sophistication of other US presidents or senators. He has never been a politician. He has never been a senator, uh, unlike uh, President Obama or even President uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, he's never been a lawyer. Uh, most US politicians are from law background. Uh, he is a businessman. He understands business. He, underst he negotiates from that viewpoint. And he negotiates from a very real estate, because his focus is on real estate. So he, in my understanding, he negotiates from a very real estate entrepreneur mind. You know? So when you negotiate a trade deal with, with a country like US, and, and that too with under President uh, Donald Trump, and, and when India was giving concession before uh, to make the trade deal happen, he was asking for two more things. So he would go down, you know, you see, it seemed that the trade deal, be, a limited package trade deal will be done, but he went two steps backward. So he's, he wants to have the maximum. That's his style, you know. The way he speaks, 
uh, I'm sure that many of you listened to his uh, press conference in Delhi. Uh, she was also present, I was also present there. And, and the way he speaks, uh, the, the way he, he speaks very informally. It's, it's not, uh, you know, sort of a uh, US president style uh, of speaking. He, he speaks, he picks a fight with reporters, uh, he, he would still answer them, and he would be blunt. But I, I found him, you know, I'm, I'm talking from a reporter viewpoint, I found him that, that he was, he knew what, why he was coming here. He knew he's not getting the big deal, but he came here to get that diaspora connect, as General Kachush pointed out. The Indian diaspora in US is slowly making the big difference, you know. It's the second biggest diaspora after the Chinese in US. So it's slowly making certain differences in certain states beyond the Western and the Eastern coast. And he probably needs their support in, in long term. Uh, Indians are getting into the Congress, uh, in the state Congresses, as well as uh, in, in, the, in the federal Congress. And he probably has realized that, um, that, that the Indian diaspora in the coming years, he may not be there. He, he, he'll probably get a term, may not get a term, looks like that he'll get a term. But he knows that the value of this, this diaspora, which is, which is making the relationship, which is beyond the leadership. Secondly, he has a personal connect with Prime Minister Modi. Prime Minister Modi himself believes in, I guess, personal chemistry. And, and this man also believes in personal chemistry. I would focus on, a, on, on a, one, only one aspect of this visit, which is about, which didn't get due attention, which is about the Indo-Pacific partnership, or partnership in the Indo-Pacific region. Because this is largely remained in a more of a uh, intellectual domain. It, most media doesn't focus on it per se, apart from their edit and, and selected articles, because uh, the, the cream uh, of, of, or, or the page one or, or the, or the, um, or the minutes or, 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 the, or the ticker, those are dominated by the trade deal, things like which are, which are quote unquote more sexy enough, you know. Something like Indo-Pacific and the Indo-US partnership in Indo-Pacific probably isn't that, you know, important enough for to put it on page one because uh, if you don't juxtapose it with China, right. What India has been successful, I guess, in this time is to make US align with an Indo-Pacific. It's our Indo-Pacific vision in my opinion because I would suggest that particularly the youngsters to go and Google the last uh, Indo-US joint statement, which was uh, issued at the at the summit, and you you see a substantial uh, focus has been on the Indo-Pacific partnership. The US is inviting India to join something called Blue Dot Initiative, where Australia, Japan are already partners. How will this shape up? My understanding, India doesn't. Uh, India is cautious on this and probably will take time if it at all joins. But beyond that. There is, uh, there is a convergence of views on the Indo-Pacific region. If US is looking at containing China, we are probably looking to balance China and rebalance China in this region. We need US, we need others also in our, in the word inclusive has been mentioned in the joint statement, which to my understanding was significant because the US has come around and accepted or at least put, agreed to do a, into a joint statement. The U.S. accepts it or not, it's a different issue. Because sometimes U.S. has the habit of not accepting what has been agreed to in their own scheme of things. Because it's the world's most powerful country, it's the world's only superpower. It will uh, conduct its foreign policy based on its own interest. Just the last word on the trade deal and the Indo-U.S. trade. You know, I guess the trade deal or not, Indo-U.S. trade is on an upswing. We are buying more oil from U.S. There is U.S. investments in India, and these are happening beyond the trade deal. So whether we clinch a trade deal, whether we clinch an investment treaty, whether we clinch an FTA or not in a year, in two years or not, to my mind, it's, it's of, it's, it's, it shouldn't be seen as the end of or be it all because the trade is increasing, our purchases will be increased, the US investments in India is going to increase. Thank you. Uh, may I request to Smita Sharma for your comments, please. Uh, thank you to all of you for showing keen interest uh, in the subject. I'll talk first about the India-US relationship and then look at it from the perspective of the Trump visit and then talk about the challenges. Look, as far as the India-US relationship is concerned, without a doubt, uh, it is one of the most important relationships for India today. And nobody should have any qualms about accepting it. Uh, whatever may have been the Cold War history, where you saw uh, India aligned with the Russians, in the past two decades, uh, since of course, post the sanctions that India faced, uh, and after the Clinton regime, and after Clinton's travel to India, and especially during George Bush's term, then we had Barack Obama, the relationship may have seen a fair share of ups and downs, of diplomatic glitches, of uh, there being a cold 
period for a few months. But this relationship has evolved in a way where I think there is no zero-sum game here anymore. And which is what works to the advantage of both these countries when you talk about two democracies, one the largest and one the oldest. Because um, there are so many pillars in this relationship today which integrate these two countries. People to people is what General Katoch talked about, and I will expand on those a bit more. Uh, there was also a question about the diaspora, the Indian election, uh, the seeming intervention in American politics. But you have the other core areas. I think one of the areas that has taken up massively in this relationship has been defense. Um, in defense, what has happened is you have seen acquiring India acquiring at least $18 billion of arms and ammunition from US in the past 12 years alone. Now, this is significant. I mean, till some time back, we were looking at an Indian arms uh, system, Indian military software, hardware system, where you were acquiring at least 72 to 75% of items from Russia. So IFPRI, which does the studies on which country is acquiring how much, importing how much of military sales, now says that, of course, this has come down to almost 60%. A lot of it is also because India still continues to acquire a lot of spare parts for the Russian equipment that it already has. But the shift has been in the aviation sector. If you look at India's critical wartime platforms today, a lot of the ones that were being used, you know, which were of Russian make earlier, uh, the heavy, you know, the ones that the helicopters being used for heavy weight lifts or your critical attack helicopters, today you have the Apaches, the Chinooks actually replacing the Russian helicopters. Uh, the Indian Navy, uh, you just saw the signing of the $3 billion agreement for the Romeo helicopters during Trump's visit. Why? Because the Russians somehow have been lagging behind as far as the cutting edge technology in aviation is concerned. India is still a lot dependent on them as far as the submarines are concerned or uh, the tanks are concerned, the ground equipments are concerned. But in aviation today, uh, the doors have opened to acquire equipments, aviation aircrafts from the Americans, which was earlier closed because of that entire phase of sanctions. That has opened up. Uh, a lot of India's critical wartime platforms are actually now American make increasingly. And as you go forward, I mean, you also have India expanding its weapons basket acquisition from the Europeans, from France, from UK, uh, from Israel. Uh, that sole dependence on Russia in a way that has that is seeing a significant transformation. So I think one of the key areas for India-US and India-US today, remember, in Ibidipanjan was talking about Indo-Pacific, which was the Asia-Pacific, but uh, US realigned, recalibrated, and then gave it the name of Indo-Pacific. So the US Pacific Command is now called the Indo-Pacific Command. Uh, there, if you see the American presence of the bases, is far more, you know, from Indonesia to Australia, uh, Russians don't match up to it. Uh, the number of exercises, bilateral, multilateral, that India, US are engaged in today, uh, they can be anywhere between 20 to 24 on a year-on-year -year basis. Uh, with Russians, you have one or two. So that significant transformation of opening up, and which is why you've had two crucial foundation agreements signed. LEMOA, which is about logistics exchange agreement, so that you know you can use each other's bases for refueling purposes, uh, for logistics sharing. The other is COMCASA, where US can deliver communication systems to you, transfer, it, in, it helps increase in communication interoperability between the forces as they go in for the exercises. The third one, BICA, we are hoping it will be signed somewhere this month itself. So I think defense is the one area where we have seen the two countries pick up a lot of steam and a lot of energy. Uh, talking about the third area, it would be energy. Uh, we are living in a time now where India for the longest time has done, uh, and India is not your typical garden variety uh, country or you know, uh, when it comes to establishing relationships. I mean, we have moved from non-alignment movement to what we call today our strategic autonomy, where India wants to align with countries based on each other's needs, interests. And uh, India, uh, for energy, of course, at a t from the times when uh, India was importing its largest crude oil source from Iran, 
Now it has gone down to zero. Today you have an Iranian foreign minister, Javed Zarif, who actually tweets scathing criticism talking about the killing of Muslims in India and the Iranian ambassador was summoned by the Ministry of External Affairs. Whereas India's uh, tranche has now shifted a lot of buying LNG gas supply from the US. So as the US lands up and discovers more and more oil and gas supplies, the US will also play a crucial role in trying to keep the oil prices globally stable, along with other countries, including Saudi. The Canadians have been discovering a lot of gas, in fact, which they are keen that India should sign up for interests. And for a country of 1.3 billion and growing, the energy needs are something where, again, US uh, will play a key role. The nuclear energy part of it, while the civilian nuclear energy was, I, to my opinion, one of the most significant transformations in the India-US relationship that also changed India's, uh, you know, the way the world sees India. All credits to it goes to, of course, George Bush, uh, who under his term then did a lot of heavy lifting for India to sail through with the agreement. But then India came up with its uh, domestic liability law, which became a huge friction point between India and the US because the American, in fact, uh, makers of nuclear reactors were not comfortable with the idea that if tomorrow, unfortunately, there does happen, uh, you know, there does uh, seem to be a nuclear uh, accident of some sort, the liability for that, they said, should be fixed upon the operators of the reactors and not the makers of the reactors. So during uh, this visit, in fact, we were expecting uh, a movement forward in terms of the nuclear commerce. That hasn't happened. I'll touch upon it in a bit, a little bit more. But... Um, I think the essential part is that the bipartisan support that India and US talk about today, the bipartisan support that India enjoy, enjoys in the US, in the American Congress, regardless of whether it's the Democrats in power or Republicans in power, that is a very, very crucial component of this relationship. And that is a component that the lawmakers and the leadership need to keep in mind as they continue to engage with each other. Now, coming to uh, the Trump visit. I would say like, look, yes, every time you have a high level summit visit, it's not possible to expect an absolutely big ticket item like a civilian nuclear deal being announced or the next steps in strategic partnership. But at the same time, you do expect the visit to look concrete in terms of substance. To my opinion, uh, substance in this visit is something that um, I found a little lacking at this point in time. Of course, we did sign up for that $3 billion of acquisition of helicopters. But if you remember, the Ministry of External Affairs, uh, before the visit, in fact, announced that there would be, there were broad discussions happening and they were expecting at least five MOUs to be signed. Eventually, what was signed were actually three MOUs. One was in the, health, uh, in the mental health sector, one was in uh, the safety of medical devices, and third was between ExxonMobil and Indian Oil. But even that Indian Oil and ExxonMobil agreement was about an LNG infrastructure plant. Uh, in terms of purchase of LNG, there has been a lot of friction that's been happening between the two sides because India somehow is not comfortable buying LNG at a fixed price from the Americans because they think that they're going to run into losses. They've already been facing some losses. They would like it to be market driven. So you didn't even have, you only had 30% of what you were expecting delivered in terms of MOUs. The blue dot, uh, you know, concept right now, it looks good on paper, but trust me, it's only a dot at the moment. So there are too many dots that need to be connected before you can go anywhere close to it. So it's more like uh, it's a carrot being dangled in the joint statement, but it's not really there. Also, I mean, if you look at the trade deal again, in trade, you've had so many differences. And it's amusing because I'm sure there are so many experts here in the room. If you look back to the trade negotiations in the 90s between India and the US, and if you look at them now, somehow it gives you a sense of deja vu. It's like through the 90s till now, the two sides still seem to be talking about a lot of similar issues and a lot of uh, friction uh, concerns still remain. You've not been able to iron them out. Uh, India, of course, is not too keen to give away to a one-sided trade deal uh, because it wants it to be win-win and justifiably so. It thinks that it's unfair that you're expecting India to lower tariffs on all items, give you market access without getting anything in return, and also expecting India to lower tariffs, whereas even countries, developed countries like Japan and Korea, uh, actually have higher tariffs on certain products. So for India right now, 
the focus is really uh, India has been upset about being unilaterally withdrawn from that generalized system of preferences. India wants a restoration. Um, India also wants to ensure that the US does not classify it into a developed nations category because it takes away from certain preferential trade uh, uh, benefits that India may have been achieving. These areas will remain the friction points. And uh, the fact that Lighthizer is a formidable opponent, the fact that uh, Lighthizer is very conservative, and you also have an inward-looking president uh, who is fighting on a protectionist flank. How to reconcile Make America Great Again with a Make in India? This is going to be a question that will remain till you find answers to this. For India and the US, I think um, somebody mentioned about Afghanistan, Pakistan. That's another area where India is a lot worried about what's happening. Because I think what AFPAC has also done is, it has made it very clear that what the Indian government may go and tom tom and say that, you know, we've isolated Pakistan. Isolating Pakistan is not a reality. And it cannot be achieved on the international stage. You can put pressure on Pakistan. So you need to get realistic about what your goals are. Because the Americans are not going to lean too hard on Pakistan till the time they need Pakistan for a troops pull out from Afghanistan. And India has several worries at this point in time. India was very, very hesitant to be in the same room with the Taliban. Only last year did we send two retired ambassadors, 2018, uh, 2019 rather, two retired ambassadors that to, in a very sheepish way, calling them as non-official officials. So go figure whatever that means. And these gentlemen went into the room. This time, of course, when the uh, agreement was being inked by Zalmi Khalilzad and Secretary Pompeo uh, with the Taliban in Doha, uh, the Indian ambassador to Qatar was in the room. And before even the ink dried, you've seen uh, the, the agreement literally being ripped off. Uh, today, of course, Khalilzad has just tweeted to say that he has had a word with Mullah Baradar and they're trying to get back again to some sort of a semblance of deal. But what India's worries are going to be eventually in the scenario of the true pullout, which will happen. And it is one of the big promises that Donald Trump wants to meet before his re-election bid. Uh, what is the role of Pakistan that's going to be in the region? A lot of the military camps that are right now operating from, and the India-centric camps, will they shift to these bordering areas in Afghanistan? What will the spillover effect be, uh, especially in terms of the Kashmir context? These are all questions that, and India has made an investment so far of around $3 billion in Afghanistan. I mean, Donald Trump may think that India has built a library. Uh, India actually hasn't built a library. India has built a parliament building. India has built infrastructure building. It's built, uh, India has built dams. Uh, till the recent past, in fact, just in the recent past, there was a phase when India actually had to pull out and stay away from Afghanistan. But that's something India can't afford to do anymore. So India will have to engage with the US to find out what is it next that India can do without putting troops on the ground. And Donald Trump has made it very clear that he would like India to loosen up its pockets and spend a bit more. On Indo-Pacific, my only worry is that, of course, China is the, uh, you know, is the big competition, the big threat for India today. And if you look at uh, Vijay Gokhale, uh, who is just retired as foreign secretary, he's given a speech in Pune which talks about the India-China relationship. In Indo-Pacific, I think the US needs India more. And that's something that India needs to leverage. Whatever might have been their political campaign rhetoric, no government has come and overturned agreements that it entered into with China overnight with the previous governments, because they can't do that. You know, if you, you can't be a kid who whines and tells, miss, miss, see, you know, what is China doing? If you have a problem with China, then also do your bit. Then give them an option. If, if Sri Lanka wants to come to you, you will have to give them an option. I mean, India and Japan are doing collaborating on projects in Sri Lanka, in Bangladesh. Uh, if, you, if you think that BRI is bad, and justifiably so, there are, there are severe arguments against BRI. What is the infrastructure options that in Australia, Japan, India, US are being able to provide? What are the alternate financial, financing, in fact, capabilities that you can provide to these smaller countries so that they have a choice between China and between uh, these countries. So I think uh, <coughs> these are going to be the big areas where you'll see collaboration as well as challenges coming in for India and the US. And uh, on the issue of the domestic diaspora and politics, I think, look, whatever has happened with the Trump visit today, there were two factors to it. One was on the personal chemistry and optics. 
Of course, it worked very well for Prime Minister Modi. It's a shot in the arm. When at a time you are facing a lot of international criticism about your domestic developments, you have the American president come in on a standalone visit less for almost 36 hours um, and who does not actually sort of change that visit schedule because a trade deal does not happen. He could have done that. He's temperamental. You know, he could have said, I'm not coming because it, but he still came in because he realizes the political premium attached to India and the Indian diaspora. For Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who has an eye for optics, I mean, he goes the extra mile. So be, uh, and, and for somebody like a Trump, who's been a, a former reality TV star, whose foreign policy is like a reality TV show. I mean, he's like the Salman Khan of the diplomatic global community. You know, he likes giving commands. He likes doing the uh, big boss kind of attitude. But uh, while it may have worked for the two gentlemen, my worry is that India must not get on a slippery slope. And I'm right. I'm, uh, I mean, you are right, sir, when you say that uh, should India interfere, be seen as interfering, because the Republicans have this time actually come out with ads targeting the Indian American community in a more specific way than it has ever been in American presidential elections. We saw something similar in the UK elections recently. Uh, in a howdy Modi, when a Donald Trump comes in, joins hands with Narendra Modi, he goes back and there is a spin given saying that India is endorsing Donald Trump's re-election bid in November of 2020 and you have to put in a clarification. Why? Because, look, you are not going to brush away the criticism that is coming on your way on developments related to the Citizenship Amendment Act, uh, NRC, the kind of violence that has happened, the Delhi violence that has claimed at least 47 lives. Uh, just on my way, I was reading a report on Bloomberg, which, which uh, has spoken to a lot of top, in fact, CEOs, MNCs and companies and they are not bullish on India at the moment because they are worried about the law and order scenario. They are worried about your governance issues. Uh, they are worried about the polarizing, shrill rhetoric that you're hearing in the country. So while one may point out to the Americans and say, oh, why are you sitting on a high ground? You know, you also do things. We have to remember in America, the, the wheels, the democratic institutions are really strong. So sooner than later, if Trump may choose to do something, I mean, they do have their courts that act fast every time a black man gets killed. Yes, black men do get killed there, but the courts also act fast. They hand out swift punishments. Uh, the press is still strong. I mean, a Jim Acosta who knows that he has to be on that same plane with Donald Trump on his way back home to the DC can actually look at a Donald Trump in his eyes and say that on most days, what you are blaming us of talking, uh, of putting out uh, uh, lies, but on most days we are actually more truthful than you are. He does that knowing very well that he'll still be on board <laughs> on Air Force One with Donald Trump. So for us, unfortunately, I think we have seen a weakening of our own institutional mechanisms. And that is something to be kept in mind, that when you go forward with this relationship, you had an Eisenhower also who came in in 1959, and an Nehru gave him a you know a, a grand welcome. You had half a million people turning up, which is more, way more than the people who came up in Motera. But those were different times. The people could do rallies in the open. Now you cannot. This relationship has achieved a very Im big importance today. Uh, you must not reduce it to one where it becomes uh, basically between two men because Donald Trump may still win the election come back for four years but this relationship is going to last beyond four years so that's where you have to ensure that when the US Congress starts to debate CA you know you've had just uh, and I'll be just making my concluding comment uh, just uh, last week I remember on one day Ravish Kumar and I don't uh, I'm not jealous of his position he has to defend the government's foreign policy decisions uh, he had criticisms that had come in from OIC USCIRF, which is the Religious Freedom Institute under the US Congress. Uh, there were senators, there were uh, US uh, House Affairs Committee on Foreign Policy. There were some six international organizations that had spoken out on the Delhi violence on the same day. So yes, you do have a global image issue today. You will have to assure not just your countrymen internally, you will also have to assure externally that you're ready to not over uh, get over these divides, these uh, these chasms,
but also be able because only then you can focus on the next step in manufacturing you can focus you know pulling out of an rcep leads to a lot of questions this this book that dr gore has written on uh, you will have to prioritize your domestic goals work on them to ensure that this relationship remains on a solid ground because i think amongst all these strategic partnerships that india has today definitely us france happen to be a very very important relationship that you cannot lose sight of i leave it there when an american president comes to india this itself is significant wherever he goes whoever may be the president of the united states if he visits a particular country and moreover if it is a stand alone visit that itself is very very important soon after he made the visit and went back he landed and he tweeted great india uh, trip successful around the same time prime minister narendra modi made a statement here it was a path breaking visit by the american president now the question is uh, if donald trump says it was a successful visit was it successful for <coughs> india we have to think if prime minister modi says that this was path breaking does it mean that it is really win win one can debate in very many ways let me begin by saying something about what the critics would say they said the donald trump condemned india criticized india in very many ways and then he visits india now he says india is a tariff king he comes to india and says the same thing in washington dc uh, sitting next to the pakistani prime minister he would say i would like to uh, mediate in your kashmir dispute with india as the report says he comes to india and he says the same thing then in india he praises the pakistani prime minister is a good friend and together we are combating terrorism he says hardly anything about china and both pakistan and china are a country of concern for india so was it really a good trip he came all the way people said for last two years indians and americans are negotiating a trade deal he imposed high tariff india retaliated on 28 uh, items of imports from the united states he comes here no deal was signed and when no deal was signed he said some big deal is in the waiting and the government of india also says not to worry wait uh, things will improve we need not be in a hurry to sign a trade deal then he comes and signs uh, a deal defense deal <coughs> worth about 3 billion dollar did he really have to travel 8000 kilometers to sign a deal uh, of 3 billion dollar on defense issues there so many defense deals have been made without an american presidential visit to delhi so why is he coming and then uh, did he really commit that he would do something about uh, constraining the spreading chinese influence and muscle flexing in south china sea indian ocean and elsewhere no he did not then how can we say this trip was at all successful what is so path breaking about it <laughs> and when he said it was successful does it mean that donald trump came and he said indo us trade deal not very fair you guys are not opening up the market and you really charge very high tariff one of the highest uh, tariff uh, imposition uh, among all the countries so what is it but this is what the critics said and would continue to say now how would i look at it very brief, briefly point wise we can during q and a you can discuss more number 1 initially when i said an american president making a stand alone visit is significant not going to pakistan not going to china not going anywhere particularly when an american president is facing an election in november in a few months time taking time out and traveling 8000 kilometers a person like donald trump who is a businessman who values time who values money 
would not be wasting his time to come to India and have a darshan of the Taj Mahal and feel very happy that 100,000 people greeted him and he would go back. Was he really looking for that kind of satisfaction? No, it wasn't. Some people said, no, 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 he's coming because he is seeking the vote of the Indian Americans. Three to four million Indian Americans are there. And he's coming to India so that Indian Americans will be very happy about it. Was it really so? Was he traveling to India just to get some votes? What is the percentage of Indian Americans in the United States? What is the American election system? Is it a direct election? And they will feel very happy that Donald Trump went to India and all the Gujaratis in Ahmedabad and some Indians from other parts of India came and said hello to him, he gave a fantastic speech, let us vote for him. I would say let us not undermine the intelligence of the Indian, Indian Americans. Large and all of them are already uh, members of the Democratic Party and vote for Democratic Party. So he was not coming to India just for votes. It's not like India, you have vote bank. Indian Americans don't constitute a vote bank. So forget about it. That means Donald Trump, among all the relationships around the world, looks at India as a positive partner. He had nasty things to say about NATO. And he made kind of comments in Japan and South Korea, unpalatable to the Japanese. You look, at, look after your security. You want to make a bomb, you make a bomb. Why are you depending on American nuclear umbrella? That kind of statement came from him. He had so many negative things to say about so many world leaders. But look what he said about Narendra Modi ji in India and even in the United States. Was it really a kind of optics? Uh, Modi would pat his back and he would pat Modi's back and you know two leaders. That is one way of looking at it. Critics would always say like that. What I look at it as a student of American foreign policy and politics and international politics. You know, policies may be made, objectives may be outlined, but ultimately for implementing the policies, you need the attention from the top. If people at the section officer level or you know, director level would conduct the relationship, it is different. If it get gets the attention from the top, then it has a different dynamism altogether that we have to appreciate. The role of the leaders who really are in charge of implementing policy. So in that context, it is important. Did he say many things negative about India? Yes. Was he really tough on India on many, many issues? Yes. That is why the trip was important, simply because the American president is making some outlandish statements about certain things. Doesn't mean that we should isolate that person. We should engage him. He's a polarizing factor in the, in the United States and even in the international community. But we have to accept that he is the president of the United States of America. He's almost completed three years of his service and if the trend continues, he may win the election again. We cannot wish him away, engage him. And I think we engaged him very well. And when a person like Donald Trump, what he says, when he says, what he tweets, when he tweets, uh, are very uncertain, saying that I'm really happy about coming to India. From now onwards, India will find a special place in my heart for all time to come. That means something if you do the psychological analysis, psychoanalysis. Number two. Yes, he signed $3 billion of defense deal, some helicopters and all. Here, what he did not say, I give importance to that. He did not reiterate that don't buy S-400 from Russia. <laughs> he kept quiet. I think that is a very good news. And he thinks Indians are going to buy more. After all, they are not thrusting on India. You buy this, you buy that. The Americans are offering. We are buying. We have the choice to buy or not to buy. So if that particular deal was signed, in my view, it is OK. As far as the trade deal is concerned, I think I'll go by what our ministries here said before he would land, before Trump would land, and what even Trump said when he was on the Indian soil. There are difficult issues, like taking India out of GSP. Then you have the H-1B visa issue. And then you have the, you know, this data localization issue. A totalization issue. These are all critical issues. 
he may take India off the GSP list. It's not that he's certifying that India has now become a developed country. No, there is business. It is negotiation. It is bargaining. It is hard. So we should not hurry up and sign a deal simply because there is a presidential visit right now to India. That was okay. On Kashmir, many people, in fact, I gave interview to quite a few uh, channels and websites and all. What is he going to say on Kashmir? He said he's, he would like to mediate. My answer is, what he did not say about Kashmir is important and we should take note of it. Simply because he's offering his mediation, we need not be upset about it. After all, without Indian agreement and unwillingness, he cannot mediate. He did not challenge the legal validity of abrogation of Article 371. That's a very big thing. Trump administration has not challenged whatever government of India did in Kashmir. When Pakistan and China together were trying very hard to discuss Kashmir issue in the UN Security Council, ultimately when India succeeded in preventing that, there was strong American support. In the FATF, when they're keeping Pakistan on the hit list even now, and another round of discussion is going to take place in June, and if that was possible, it was simply not because of Indian, India's diplomacy with other countries. The American support was really important. How would China, this fellow never criticized China in India? No. The kind of signals he sent to China, in my view, is important. Like for example, just to give you one example, the Chinese are pretty upset about the concept of Indo-Pacific. They think India is being highlighted, Asia-Pacific was different, they don't like it at all. I have interacted with very many Chinese uh, people, even at the government level and the university level, they don't like it. But the joint statement that was uh, issued, if you take a look at it, out of 21 small, small, small paragraphs, five paragraphs are devoted to Indo-Pacific. Number two, he did not uh, criticize India for allowing the Huawei for 5G uh, tender. And number three, when he mentions about the BRI and saying that India and America, they re-emphasize India and the US would always support a transparent deal as far as BRI related investments are concerned. And there should be rule-based, transparent policy, particularly uh, on giving uh, loans, etc. That was hinted, aimed at China. So people who understand the dynamics don't just analyze uh, Trump's visit to India on the basis of current affairs, on the basis of reading newspapers and watching television and see the big picture. They know that whether we say or we don't say, we write or don't write, China is the big elephant in the room. Increasingly, Indians and the Americans are together on this. On Pakistan, it's all right, he said, Imran Khan is a great friend, we're engaging Pakistan to combat terrorism, etc. And people said, what this guy is doing? He's coming and praising India, then also praising Imran Khan? <laughs> but don't go by his statement alone. Let's go by what is written down in the joint statement signed by the Prime Minister and the President. There they do mention about urging Pakistan or pressurizing Pakistan uh, or nudging Pakistan. There's some term, I, I forget whatever is written there. Pakistan must not allow its territory to launch terrorist attacks. It is written in the joint statement. If you run your eyes through the report in the Pakistani media on of what Trump said in Kashmir, they all talk about what he said in Ahmedabad, and <laughs> they ignore what is there in the joint statement. So overall, if you see all these things, I think it was a very, very useful visit by an American president. They are increasingly taking note of it. In my concluding observations, just a few. What next? Uh, this is my view. This is a view of many other people also. Prime Minister Modi goes to Houston and in, the, in a way endorses 
President Trump's candidate. Now he comes to Ahmedabad, a much bigger show, double the size of the people in the audience and all. Somehow down the lane, it is sending a signal to the Democrats that these Indians are now siding with a Republican president. We must not give that kind of impression. The bipartisan consensus that is there in Washington, D.C. on engaging India, that has to be maintained. If you see the tweet of Bernie Sanders and others, I think they think that Narendra Modi has put all the eggs in the Trump basket and that should not be done, right? This is number one. Number two, November is quite far. Elections, after eight months, what is going to happen, we do not know. If the present trend continues, of course, Trump will win. But what is the guarantee? Nobody has seen the future. That is why it is important from diplomatic point of view to engage people belonging to all kinds of political spectrum. That is, we should do that. Number two, the critical issues like GSP and all the trade deals are really serious. We cannot put a full stop that Donald Trump has told us a big deal is in the offing. I think critical issues are at stake. And uh, American politicians particularly would not understand uh, critical aspects of the political economy of the world. Generally, the American congressmen, senators also at that level, they think, oh, Americans are doing a great job giving assistance to many, many countries, third world countries, developing countries. <laughs> Why should we pay our taxpayers' money to Tanzania or uh, Ghana or South Pacific Islands? Questions are raised in American debate. For every one dollar given, given as assistance, to the developing countries. Ultimately, the Americans get $4 in return over the years. It is not just free doling out, no free lunch in the United States. So there are many issues, even on Indo-US deal, you know, it is not one-sided at all. The Americans get benefit out of it. They're not at the bleeding hearts. Are in Garib, India, go madad karo type. It, no, it is hard economics. So we need not be in a hurry, but we have to show our, play our card very well in times to come. Finally, there are many things to say, but finally, on Afghanistan, many people say Americans are already uh, doing some dealing with uh, the Taliban when Donald Trump comes to India. And the moment he goes back, the deal was signed. What was India's role? We have spent about two, three billion dollars in Afghanistan, and what is going to happen to India's future role in Afghanistan? Big questions came. That time, of course, again, uh, in the interview, my observation was, don't be too happy. Deal is about to sign. All right, there's so many times this kind of deals have been signed. Things may change, and things have changed. In a matter of two days, more than 40 attacks by Taliban. More recently, the American airstrike on Taliban have taken, have already taken place. So things are going to continue in certain areas where we need to cooperate, collaborate, particularly uh, in the area of committing terrorism. I think with these brief remarks, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Now there is one point which I would like to highlight as, as per one aspect of this because I have seen it and I've seen it firsthand. What is the difference in the present foreign policy of India, which was not there earlier. By and large, Indian foreign policy has been very consistent. You see, regardless of uh, political changes, the Indian foreign policy has been remarkably consistent, but now you're finding dramatic changes. I think the first important change which you're looking at is India has stopped hyphenating countries and we refuse to get hyphenated ourselves. So what happened with India? When we, when the, when we go to Israel, we don't have to worry about Palestine. It doesn't matter. We deal with Israel on a one-to-one -one basis. And then we will deal with Palestine on a one-to-one -one basis. It doesn't matter what uh, Israelis think. We will deal with Palestine on its merits. We will deal with Israel on its merits. So we will deal with Saudi Arabia on its merits, and we'll deal with Iran also on its merits. We don't hyphenate the two. It doesn't really matter. Let both of them kill each other. It's OK. We will deal with you on your merits. And that is why we are dealing with America on its merits, and we will deal with Russia on its merits too. We have stopped hyphenating. 
and we made it very clear. And I think this is, uh, in a very large sense, shows the extent to which Indian foreign policy has now matured. It is being dynamically led. If I have to give any credit to the government over the last six years on any one, one field, it won't be the economic field or something, it'll be the foreign policy field. I think the one place where we have really succeeded is the foreign policy field. Now, uh, Professor Chintamani rightly said, you see, uh, so many things haven't happened. Obviously, they haven't happened. Diplomacy is not in making things go right. Diplomacy is in preventing things from going wrong. Let us put it that way. It is basically conflict management. There is no way in which you can win. You can simply cut your losses. And I think we have been managing to cut our losses quite well, much, much more than otherwise. Because there is no way in which you can ever, ever hope to say that we are going to win everything. It's not going to happen. So I think a certain element of realism has to come into our policies. What are we doing now? Right? And how are we going to shape it up? The second aspect I want to talk about is uh, the defense aspect. And then I want to go into strategic convergences and divergences, which I will end with that. You see, I think the defense partnership has taken off in a grand way, in a really great way. Now, what was so important and why is it so important? Our former president, Abdul Kalam Saab, made a very pertinent statement. He said, we import 70% of our defense equipment and we just manufacture 30%. And he said, we need to reverse it. Now, he tried very hard. We still haven't really got onto that. The Make in India thing is a, is a work in progress because defense things have a very long gestation period. People have asked me, you had Make in India for five years, why has nothing happened? Well, it's not going to take place in five years. Look at 15 years. If something happens in 15 years, I'll be very happy if we can actually make that shift. We need to get our defense industry functioning the way ISRO is functioning. We need to get our defense industry functioning the way the missile program has functioned. I mean, if you look at your Brahmos missile, it is the best missile in the world. It is unbeatable. So it is not to say that Indians don't have the capability. We have the best brains. We have the best scientists. We have the best academics. We have the best of everything. And yet we don't do it. So that why we don't do it, I think that is the question. Technologically, I think this assistance now, which we are going to get with the US, especially with Bika coming up, the, the fourth foundational agreement, I think if we can have that cooperative, cooperative level by which we can start manufacturing together, we have a great deal to offer in terms of software and space technologies, which we can share with the Americans. Uh, so it's not that it's going to be a one-sided traffic, but then technology, I think we, we can get a great deal uh, of it too. And if we can start through the Americans this system, I think, I think we would be very well off. The second part, part I think, why this defense technology, this uh, defense agreement with the uh, Americans is important is, um, when we are looking at technologies coming up, the futuristic technologies, the only two people who are the global leaders as of now are the Americans and the Russians. The Israelis are in the American camp, so I'll, I'll put all of them together there. Uh, the Chinese are way behind, let's, let's face it. The Chinese are way behind, though they are catching up very fastly. So if we want to really be competitors, I think what we need to do is to get onto the technology band weapon, uh, bandwagon, get there fastest. And if, once we get that, then I think we are in a position to do whatever we have to do. But now I want to talk about the strategic aspect, and there are three things which I think which we need to... Uh, here I will delve on, delve on it into, in a little bit. The first is the pivot to Asia. Now, why was this pivot to Asia? You know, when we talk of a pivot to Asia, we're really meaning that, you know, you're getting towards the Central Asian systems, right? You're getting onto the Indian Ocean and you're getting onto the uh, South China Sea. Now, why was this pivot necessitated? And I think it had something to do with energy resources. For the first time, America found it was not dependent on, upon West Asia at all. So America became self-sufficient in energy and now America is exporting, exporting energy. So once America starts exporting energy, what happens in West Asia doesn't make a damn sausage of a difference to it, very frankly. So if the Arabs go and kill each other and the Iranians, they kill each other, okay, it's okay. Uh, it won't come into the human rights angle. That will only happen where they get concerned, otherwise they won't bother. So I think this energy thing is something which we need to look into as to why this shift has taken place. This is one. Number two, if you look at, you know, when they say that the 21st century is the Asian century, why? It is because sometime this year or last year, at some point of time, the um, economy the, of all the Asian countries combined exceeded the world. So this shift to Asia is a very dramatic, uh, that is in, in uh, uh, purchasing power parity and not in real terms. But PP, in, in PPP terms, you know, now the economic shift is bigger here. So if you're looking at Asia as growing every year and that the gap between Asia and the rest of the world is going to keep getting bigger and bigger, that is why it is called the Asian century. Simple. Now, how does Asia get its resources? It is the complete dependence is upon the Indian Ocean. 
the complete dependence. So you are finding world trade now is shifting to the Indian Ocean. And any disruption to this, to this world trade on the Indian Ocean has an impact. So this shift to Asia and the Indian Ocean region has great strategic importance for the world and for the United States. How they do their trade this side and the trade is shifting here. So I think it was, it, it was very well planned out as far as the Americans are concerned as to why they need this shift. And why do they need India? Because if you look at the map, India's centrality as far as the Indian Ocean is concerned, the fact that India's economy is growing and we can afford to do it, I think we are in a position, uh, the Americans think that, okay, we can partner with India. Because at some point of time, as Donald Trump is a transactional man, as so ably stated by my uh, uh, colleagues, he doesn't want to do all the spending. I mean, he says, why should I be spending all the money and keeping you chap secure? You also put in a little bit. That, that is a wonder, fundamental premise on which uh, uh, Donald Trump is based. And I, and I think in that context, he realizes, okay, let India also do up its bit. So now when you have got uh, the, uh, the, the Romeo helicopter, the Sea King helicopter, and we are buying 24 of them, the significance of that is really to keep the sea lanes secure because we don't want any submarines moving into that area. And the Sea King is an anti-submarine anti helicopter. It can also operate against service ships and it's got many other roles too. But ultimately, it is designed to catch these submarines. And the Chinese submarines are now entering this area and we don't want them to enter. So there has to be somebody to tell those chaps, okay, listen, you are entering here, we know where you are and uh, we'll take care of you. There is, now I'll just talk about a few divergences. I think when we're looking at uh, the AFPAC region, there is a divergence. When I, uh, you know, when this question came up that uh, the, the Americans will withdraw, uh, I made it very, very plain on, on, on the TV studio. I said, it, it, it is not good news for India. America leaving Afghanistan is not good news for India. Now, whether they will leave or not, of course, that's a million dollar question. As Professor Chintamani said, they may not leave. I remember when uh, President Obama was the uh, president and uh, they, were, they were having a drawdown and uh, Obama in his speech said, we're going to pull out of Afghani Afghanistan. I was heading the Indian Army's think tank and the American delegation had come there. And I told them, I said, you can't do it. And the Americans said, our president has ordered it, we will do it. I said, you can't do it. They couldn't do it. The question is, there is a logic to what is happening in a particular area. So if, you, if the Americans withdraw, then what is the situation going to be? What is the situation they're going to leave behind in Afghanistan? We, are, we have got two people who are fighting that particular conflict as of now. One is the Afghan National Security Forces, that are the government forces, both their police and their army. And the, on the other side is the Taliban, which is supported by Pakistan. Uh, the public really doesn't really matter. If you go to Afghanistan and ask any common Afghan, which is the country which you like the best? India is number one. And they'll say, which is the country which you like, which you hate the most? Pakistan comes number one there. They hate Pakistanis more than they, more than they hate the Americans. But will that make a difference? Honestly, it won't really make a, the public opinion in Afghanistan is not going to make a difference. There's a reality in Afghanistan which is going to make that difference. And I will posit to you my concern of that reality and how it can fit into the Indo-US equilibrium. There are two things, in my view, which can keep the Afghan National Security Forces where they are. In my view, they are strong enough and capable enough to hold the Taliban. But it requires $3 billion a year in financial support to maintain them. Now, that money as of now is coming from NATO uh, and the uh, America and, and their allies, Japan. Japan is, of course, part of NATO. Now, will that money continue coming? Because if that money continues coming, then these forces will hold on. And the second, second element is there has to be some element of US forces. Some element. It doesn't have to be 12,000 or 14,000 troops. Say five to 6,000 troops if they are there and this financial support comes, they can hold the Taliban. But if it goes away, then over a period of time, the Taliban will overrun this country. And if it overruns this country, then you're looking at civil war. Please take it from me. You're not looking at any nice patch up. There will be civil war because there can be no rapprochement between these two sides. The Taliban wants a very strict Sharia state. They want their women covered from head to toe. They don't want the girls to go to school. They want the men to have a beard of a certain length. They want all that. And they're not going to compromise on that. So if somebody misbehaves, they want him on the square and they want to chop his neck off. That is the Taliban. They are not going to, you will get back to the Taliban of what it was. And if you really want to know what the Taliban is about, uh, read that book, uh, uh, A Many Splendid Moon or something like that, written by uh, Khalid. Yeah. Uh, uh, which is that one? Uh, 
Thousand Splendid Sons or something. Thousand Splendid. Khaled Husseini. Read that book. It's a, it's a novel, yes. But it gives you the reality of what uh, Islamic State is. Right? So it is, not going to be, it is not going to be pleasant. And it now, what this is what our concern is. And I believe that this concern would have been given to the American president. But whether that concern has been given or not to the American president, they, they, uh, they, 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 they are not babes in the world. They know what's going to happen. So whether they will pull out or which way they're going to do it, I really don't know. But if they are prepared for a civil war in Afghanistan, then I think they will pull out. So if they pull out, and as I said, it's not good news for India, what will happen to India? Uh, you're going to have a very difficult situation in, in Afghanistan. Uh, I think we are going to get back to that Northern Alliance system, you know, uh, uh, with, with two people fighting against each other. You will have over five to six years after fighting the Taliban back in power. And then Pakistan will try to put in as many of those terrorists as they can to Kashmir. That as, as far as our interests are concerned, so long as Indian, the Indian armed forces, especially the Indian Air Force, can give a befitting response to the Chinese or the Tibetan plateau, there will be no conflict. The day they find the power equation has shifted, there's going to be a problem. Which is why, again, this, this alliance or this shift with the United States, I think it is important, right? So let us not get wishy-washy. These are hard power realities. Uh, America's, Americans are not easy to get along with. Well, neither are the Chinese. They, they think Indians are not easy to get along with. That's all right, but that's the way politics is played. But I think we must be very concerned about our own, uh, about our own interests, which way our interests lie. And in my view, there are two things which we really need to do. You get your economy going, one. Get your defense preparedness up to the appropriate shape, too. And then, of course, everything else will fall into shape. But these two are the prime, uh, the prime takeaways. And how the Americans can help us in getting these two things right, I think, will be the challenge for our political leadership, for our, uh, for our diplomats, and for civil society.